I don't have a pessimistic view concerning what democracy is about to be uh, in decline, in agony, close to that, close to death. There are many books uh, uh, today that they present democracy as almost very close to an end. Uh, particularly after Brexit and particularly after uh, the election of Trump, that is after two important events in two major countries for democracy history, uh, it seems that uh, uh, this word democracy is uh, representing uh, a world of a movement, a government, a way of living that is under threat and under question. Well, I have problems with this reading, not for ideological reason, but because, um, for two reasons basically. First of all, because when we say that uh, democracy is toward an end, or democracy is almost agonizing, it is as if we know teleologically what is the goal that democracy is supposed to achieve? And if democracy does not achieve that goal, then we start thinking about a decline. But if this is the case, if we knew in advance what would be the trajectory of democracy and what democracy is going to do, well, that is not longer a democracy that we are talking about. It's another system that I don't know what kind of. So th there is in democracy an aspect that uh, a characteristic of openness does open to risk, does open to transformation, that these readings about decline and death and agony, they seem not to, not to consider. This is one argument. The other argument is that the following. We have to, pay, to take seriously what, uh, what uh, um, constitutional democracy is about. When we speak about democracy, we don't speak about uh, the Athenian model of democracy, direct democracy, or even not the democracy in the Swiss local direct democracy through referendum. We have in mind the democratic societies we live in, which are based on representations, based on election and with a constitution. So when we use the word democracy, we imply all of that, which is a very complex organization of uh, uh, political behavior inside of the institutions and outside of the institution, and I'll come very soon with that. So this is democracy. So let's clarify that we are talking about constitutional democracy. Now, if we are uh, clear on line that we are talking about constitutional democracy, we have to ask the question, when we claim that there is a kind of agony of democracy, what is that in this constitutional democracy is changed so much that we see a kind of agonizing regime? And this is a good question to ask, because if democracy is still with the same kind of constitution that presumes the rule of law, the division of power, a system of uh, uh, basic rights that are still defended or guaranteed by the organization of the justice system, and if uh, there is a separation between uh, those who are in government and the state organizations and civil society and the state, then it is very hard for me to understand what we are talking about when we are talking about democracy is dying. So there is something else then we have to pay attention, not to the institutional aspect. Perhaps this remains very much similar or quasi similar. But it is another aspect that we have to pay attention to what's happened outside of the institutions. So this um, for me, it is important because constitutional representative democracy has, is kind of a, a person with two legs, not one. That is not only the consent of the citizens, like in the old direct democracy with the, the assembly that was practically the absolute sovereign, deciding every time, every day, with a law, with a decision, 
what was the will of the people. We are not in the, that kind of democracy. We are in a democracy in which uh, there is a temporality of constru in the construction of consent. When we go to vote every four years or every five years, we construct a kind of memory of uh, or correlation between time one and time two of elections. They are not like uh, moments, ex uh, ante moment or uh, absolute moments, like Puntinism, you know, the, 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 the style, the style of, uh, of uh, painting, the Puntinism. They're not like kind of points, one separate from the other, but there is a, but there is a, a, a yes, there is a narrative, a narrative, a correlation between one time and the other one. So that we construct history through democracy. The history of our political discourses, the history of our uh, proposals, or preferences and so on and so forth. It's very complex and very unified in some sense. Now, if this is the description, it means that we citizens, we do two jobs, two kind of jobs, not only deciding on giving a vote, but we also play an important role outside of the institutional moment. In fact, we play only the role outside of the institutional moment, aside for the moment in which we go to vote. And this domain of opinion formation that Habermas used to call the public sphere of uh, um, opinion and information, that sphere is really the place we have to look at when we want to understand why today we feel and we perceive we are scared, in fact, that democracy is in a, critic, in a critical moment. Because institutions, apart from moments in which we can see a change of constitutions, they tend to resist and to stay. But the other aspect is truly changing. I have this in mind because, for instance, think about the case of the United States today with Trump. Now, what is changing truly uh, uh, in the American society today is not so much the institutional aspects. There is no change of constitutions and there is no change of the practices of justice, local government, federations and states uh, actions. But the real change is in the domain of language, opinion, everyday construction of audience through new and old medias. This is an important change. It is a change in the in the way in, in the way in which people interact, in the way in which people operate with language. So for instance, uh, although a populist government, let's call him, let's call America in this case a populist government, even, even if a populist government doesn't change a constitution, doesn't change institutions, it introduces some important changes inside of uh, the forms in which people operate in the public. And they do so in a way that is uh, disparaging toward uh, those who are in the minority, disparaging of the adversary so that even if there is no cancellation of elections, there is an, a, a permanent work of humiliation of the opposition and of those who are in the opposition with the also idea that there is a kind of a threat coming from the opposition toward the government and toward the good America. So I think that this is a real issue that has to do with the transformation of the way in which opinions is formed. That is, for me, an important aspect. The other aspect that we have to pay attention to analyze and to see the many uh, changes is the transformation inside of the domain in which uh, opinions are formed. So, democracy, constitutional and representative, comes from an organization and a way of organizing uh, the political discourse that is made and based on intermediary bodies, intermediations. The intermediations is uh, political parties, unions, associations of uh, any kind, and media. When I use the word media, I, means, I mean 
that there is a class of people, a group of people, journalists, accredited journalists, recognized as such, who plays a role, they can be an object of criticism, of course, of uh, not only collecting inform in information, collecting informations and giving uh, interpretations, but they have a kind of uh, recognition of uh, validity in what they do. Because they are not simply, you know, ordinary like citizens, they have a kind of responsibility as journalists, as part of accredited media. Now, with the new media, or with the new, you know, with the internet and the easiness to enter in this world, uh, everybody does. The real, the real new and the real uh, novelty of this is that the intermediary body have lost their legitimacy. They are considered to be the establishment, those who are, who put themselves separated from the people and they declare what is the true and what is not, what is what deserves to be considered and what is not, what are the news that needs to be uh, known and not. That is, they people start seeing in this group of separated professional of the opinion a kind of violation of principle of popular democracy. You feel and you can hear this criticism almost everywhere. So, an argument used is the democratization of horizontalizations of media and information technology, uh, which is considered to be more democratic because there is no authority inside, separated from those who create uh, the, the uh, audience and those who create the news, nobody outside validating what is right and what is wrong. So this is an important transformation. We really don't know how this is going to change, to change democracy. We really don't know, but it's going to do to change. Why? Because it is a way of pressing very much a moment of directness instead of the acceptance of the indirect way of uh, doing politics and collecting opinions as we used before. So representative democracy from 19th century until very recently, it was mediated, it was organized through intermediation. And this intermediation was accepted. I will come later on if you want to do, if you want about this acceptance, which was not so easy act, actually. So we presume an acceptance now, but uh, you would be right to be very skeptical about this acceptance because even parties has been, even political parties have been, they have hard time to be accepted. It's not an easy going, the one of party democracy. But for a moment, put them in, bracket them in parentheses, and uh, if I remember, I come back, and you have to remember me that I should come back, in any case. So, but mediation implies that citizens can be uh, capable of uniting, associating, Con connecting with others without, however, talking in first person. We the people, I, we are the true people. Whereas instead, with this new inter, 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 internet kind of media, it is possible to have the jump toward direct representative democracy. This is seen to be a contradiction in terms. How can you have directness and, and representation? You have representation because we go to vote, because Trump is elected, because Salvini is elected, because uh, Orban is elected. They don't want direct democracy. No populist is looking for direct democracy. But what they do, and I'll come very soon to explain a little bit more about populism as one of the disfigurements I've analyzed in the book, but populism does something as putting the people in first person doing what generally parties and accredited media used to do it before. So the people as a collective of uh, crowd without intermediations making them separated and divided into parties, into different associations, they become one large audience or one large 
group of citizenry, implying that all of them, all of us, as individual citizens, part of the same crowd, part of the same uh, people, without internal separations. This is what today we have to really consider as a great transformation. Why is a great transformation? Because it is practically the erosion of the function of political parties. Political parties have the function of separate, or organizing the people inside or the electorates according to groups, identifications, interests, ideologies, so that one large people, with the people, was articulated within different domains and different groups. No party in the party democracy style that we know used to say and to talk about with the people. They used and they knew that they were a part and they never claimed to be the whole. They claim to be a part and to try with the other parts to have compromises or to have alliances or to have a majority to vote for a time being for waiting for another, another uh, elections and perhaps another uh, majority and so on and so forth. We are instead in a, different, in a different situation which we can call populist. The situation is the following. The people is supposed to be a unified entity in which the internal partisan articulations have practically are diluted. Uh, they are liquid. They are, they are liquidated. You don't have any more parties that organize people. At most, they do party today. They create list for electoral uh, competitions. They are machi machinery for making competitive lists at the most. But they are no longer organizers of people. Organizers according to interest or according to visions, or according to ideologies. Uh, who is doing today this role of, of, organ of unifying? And this is what in the book I call the personalization of politics, meaning it is one leader or a leader capable of, as Ernesto Cloud brilliantly used to write, capable of unifying the many different claims that people have, dissatisfactions, uh, oppositions, all together with, in, and through his own person. So that the leader is the people. The leader is one of the people and is the people. The face of the people is the leader with this kind of identification of representation. So representative changes is characteristic. It's no longer the representative that goes to the parliament, they bring us our claims and we can control what they do and then perhaps you know, kick them off with, uh, if we don't like anymore. This kind of representation, since it's not based on any claims to be uh, vindicated, it's not based on any uh, kind of uh, accountability quest for, but it's based on an identification, we are identified in the face of the people, there is nothing for for us to ask for, but simply to be represented as one people through a leader. So that uh, the unification between we and the leader is based on faith, is based uh, on uh, one and the same group through one face. This is what Cloud says when he speaks about uh, populism as an hegemonic construction of a unity through the figure of the leader. Now, if this is the case, if this, and it is in many cases, uh, in many of our countries, this is the process of identification and unification, this uh, is, it, it operates by a process of exclusion and inclusion. So, we are the good people, we are the real people under the leader, the victorious leader, and the others, those who are outside of it, are not the right people, not the good people, perhaps they are the establishment, perhaps they are minorities, perhaps they are those whom the majority of
of the people considers to be not pleasant. So, institutions, even the rights, are declared to be owned by the people, owned by that kind of unified people. That is very dangerous. This is a dangerous aspect. The dangerous aspect is when a majority, conquered through elections, ends up by saying that the state is his own property, that rights are their own rights. When Salvini or when Orban or when uh, Tra uh, Trump, they say, I am here representing Italian first, Hungarian first, American first, they don't. They don't imply all of the Hungarians, all of the Italians, all of the Americans. They imply their own, the people who are with them, which is the good people. The others are those who are um, antagonizers or potentially enemies, those who are uh, incapable of uh, appreciating the real good working people who are suffering every day, as they say. This is uh, uh, the rhetoric. And so they are the elite, or they are the establishment, or they are simply the, major, the minority. Now, in these conceptions, thus, or in this practice, actually, uh, many transformations have occurred that we don't pay attention because the names are the same, the words are the same, but institutions and the procedures are different. They are used in a different way. So representation changes. It's no longer representation through elections or, or a mandate, but it is embodiment. The embodiment, as Kashmir used to say, the embodiment, it means that we are one with the, with the leader. And it's another kind of representation, different, because it's not based on accountability, it's not based on uh, vindications, it's not based on um, uh, control and criticism. How can you criticize somebody who, who hears your face or your uh, mentor or your unification? So representation is changed, but also majority is changed. Because majority, in, my, in uh, the procedural conception of democracy, it is a principle thanks to which we make decisions in uh, situations of pluralism of ideas and according to the uh, principle of counting votes and reaching a majority. It is thus not a force, not a power, but it is a method. It is a, a principle thanks to which we presume that there is an opposition. Majority implies an opposition. But when you used to say that majority is the representative of the most uh, genuine people, or as Trump used to say, the true Americans, not the others, and true Americans, then majority changes the meaning. It becomes a, a kind of metaphysical conception that is the majority is the good people. It's not a method, it is a strong force imposing its will on everybody. So when this kind of population with or this kind of political system is capable of ruling and also has the chance of changing the constitution, this, in my view, is where populism can truly be a risk to democracy. So it's not that democracy is in decline. Democracy can be under a threat and through a risky moment when populistic governments, not simply movements, because movements which are not yet government are simply part of the democratic dialectic of movements and oppositions in society. But when they become majority and then rule, and they have also the chance to change the constitution, well, in which way they are going to change the constitution? And we have examples here. We are in uh, Eastern Europe, after all, very close to Hungary. So Orban, since the moment he, uh, from 2012, if I am correct, uh, through a large majority, uh, according to the constitution, because the constitutional rules was a super majority capable of changing the constitutions, uh, it changed the constitution in a way that uh, it did not completely uh, transform democracy into a tyrannical system of majority, but it made the majority ruling now constitutionalized. 
So I, I would like to explain it very um, clearly that here we are in the city in which Hans Kelsen was born. Hans Kelsen has that had this important conception of two levels of legal orders, the constitutional level and the ordinary level, two levels of legal orders. Now, when populists in government can and they have the numbers to change the constitutions, what they tend to do? This is similar in Poland in one way that is perhaps less explicit than in Hungary, but it is in both cases clear. They tend to transform the ordinary legal norm into constitutional norm. So they constitutionalize a majority. They constitutionalize an ordinary legal system. So the separation between constitutional and ordinary collapsed and becomes one legal regime only. This is the goal that a majority, what I, I would like uh, to invite you to think in terms of using majority as an ism, as the ideology of the good people or the right people because of the majority that gives them the legitimacy to change the constitution, to make it uh, like a dress capable to adhere completely to the will of the majority. So, those of you, who are, of, of you who are familiar with, play, uh, with Aristotle, Aristotle in the politics used to analyze the politia, the constitutional regime, uh, in a way that was made of five stages from the one that we would call today constitutional system, division of power, autonomy of uh, the, the uh, justice, in which is the law, not the will of the assembly to rule. It starts with this uh, uh, scheme or this uh, synthetic way of defining the, poly, the politia, in the, the constitutional government, and it went down, down, down until it reached the point of the leader talking as if it were the people, the demagogue. That was the last stage. In between the democratic representative, the constitutional system and the demagogue, there were different kinds of politia, different kinds of constitutional regimes. And the difference was in relation to the, the way in which the assembly and the majority ruled. So we are less close to the constitutional and more to the demagogue when the will of the majority becomes the law, more and more directly. So Aristotle ends up by saying, with the demagogue, we are in the final border. After which, we certainly, we certainly have a tyrannical system. So, all this to say that if we read uh, the transformation of, the, of democracy from party system to populism, as uh, I try to do, or to tell you now, as a transformation from a constitutional way in which democracy was capable of stabilizing itself, beginning, particularly beginning from 1945, to this transformation toward a more populistic kind of, we have closed this arc of, of democracy, after which there is something else, we don't know what. So we have to pay attention to how this arc is uh, transformed in order to analyze all the aspects, as Aristotle did. Aristotle analyzed how the majority was formed, how the assembly operated, who was part of the few and the many, how the justice was organized. So we have to do the same thing. So to analyze all the aspects of representative constitutional democracy that are going through transformations. And of course, since we live in a representative system, not in a direct one, we have to analyze of the two legs the opinion of formation one very closely because it is that part 
connected to the media, from television to new media, and uh, from organizations of the opinion, that we can understand how democracy can change. So this is the um, kind of picture I gave you of one of the three um, disfigurements I analyzed in the book that has been uh, kindly translated by Biba in, uh, uh, in this, year, this year. And, and the disfigurements are three are actually in my analysis because I analyze them, these three, uh, in relation to what the opinion or doxa is about in a democracy. And doxa or opinion in a democracy plays several important roles by collecting information and thus uh, a, a cognitive kind of effort to know and to distribute knowledge. And second, it plays the role of uh, creating a political identification between citizens who are interacting uh, as uh, partisans sometimes. And third, um, a, a audience kind of, if you want to say so, uh, the, the uh, public exposure uh, of ideas and positions, the role of the public. So the role of cognitive, uh, the cognitive role, the political role, and the public role, of, there are three moments of the doxa. Now, they are together, we need all of them, we need all of them in a representative democracy and constitutional democracy. What's happened today, uh, or it can happen, and sometimes it did happen, is that each of them, sometimes they become radicalized and they occupy the entire domain instead of being one of the three. So for instance, there is a, a very important uh, branch in uh, representative, or uh, in political theory today, theory of democracy, called epistemic conception of democracy. Epistemic. Mm -hmm. It is it is an important conception which has in politics a in the reference into the technocratic uh, transformation of democracy and the idea that competence should have a large say in politics, more than the opinion of the incompetent people, better to give uh, competence than due and to restrain and to narrow the role of the people to simply the moment of elections. Hmm? This epistemic or epistocratic uh, aspect is very important. It is, an, it is an extreme consideration of opinion as playing the role of cognitive collections of information and uh, um, representation of what is going on in our society, that is give, taking information and news. It's making extreme uh, instead of uh, uh, recognizing that in democracy there is not only issue of truth and false, there are only issues, also issues of beliefs or issues of identification, thus partisan. So you cannot say that democracy is simply about achieving the good outcome and thus using procedures in order to achieve the good outcome. But, but uh, uh, it's very hard to understand what is a good outcome because it can be good now, but for a future generation or for the next turn of elections, this can no longer be good. So it is the change that is important. We consider of the conception of what is functional or good, not an absolute conception of the good. So I analyze that and criticize that. The second one is populist that I gave you an outline just now, and finally. I have the, I propose the third, uh, the third kind of uh, disfigurement, which I call disfigurements, I will tell you immediately why. The third one that is uh, the plebiscite. It's very important, this one, because in a, domain, in a society in which, uh, uh, like ours, in which uh, the audience and the public and the exposure to the public plays such a relevant role, much more than words is image, much more than parties is the popular uh, opinion of the audience, then in this case the, ple the plebiscitarization of politics, it is possible because who goes to the public to show his own persona if not a personal leader? So 
the audience moment, it is a moment in which a personalization of politics acquires recognition. Audience, as Bernard Manin analyzed in this very important book of 1997, Bernard Manin wrote this book called The Principle of Representative Government, and he made a kind of history of uh, how representation changes from 19th century with the, the notabilate, there was no universal suffrage, they were kind of the notable uh, going to the parliament of very few, representing very few, equal interest almost. Second stage, party democracy with the universal suffrage and the mass of people that needs to be organized into parties. And finally says, after Ray Lately, he wrote the book in 1997, so presumably with the construction and the explosion of television in the, uh, in the media market of uh, politics, the in indication of the audience. Audience is an important word. It implies the public. The public is not the people. The public is not the people, it is the image and perception and visual uh, 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 attention of the public toward, toward whom? Not parties, parties are collective. You don't see party in the public. They are collective entities, but you see leaders of parties, yes. So the audience wants to see the person, the public. The public wants to see the person. The public cannot see entities, sees persona. And so, uh, um, Manel says, in this stage, and he ends the book, a few pages, just a kind of picture, in this, in this new stage called audience democracy, perhaps parties are no longer capable of finding a meaningful function. And this is perhaps uh, where we are now. So I use this partition, this schematization by Bernard Manel to focus on the last one, that is audience democracy, to analyze how it is, uh, it manifests itself. And you know, there is an important author along with Bernard Manel that I really suggest, uh, it's in English, but it's uh, interesting for us, uh, if you are interested in this uh, kind of topics, called Edward Green, um, the eye of, in the eye of the people, uh, or the people's eye, uh, in which he analyzes and he compares our democracy today, like in the Roman Forum used to do, the you, Roman leaders, you know, they, the aristocracy of the patricians of the Romans, they, only, they, they, they were only the part of the population who could run for public offices, not the plebs and not the people. Fine, what they did, why we call them, why we use the expression candidate? Candidate because those who wanted to run for an office, they used to put a candidate, it's a white, candidate means white, clear, white uh, toga or stora or, or, or scarf, white, in order to indicate to the people that they were, they were ready to run for an office. Why they did so? Because they, the people wanted to control them every day. They wanted to see what they were going to do. So to have the people, to have the leader or the potential candidates with the candidate, it meant that they were all the time under the eyes of the people. So, according to Green, coming with, uh, in agreement with Banan, this is precisely what is today the audience. The audience, audience being transparency, they claim to, be, to see, they claim to visual democracy, the kind of voyeurism, we really, uh, in the audience, uh, people want to understand and to know everything about the life of the leader, from the private to the public, from the intimate, to see everything. So, seeing instead of talking, visions instead of deliberations, this is what uh, the audience democracy is about. And the medias that we have today, particularly internet, they help a lot to uh, actualize that. Now, what kind of representation is better suited to kind of this kind of democracy? In my view, precisely the, the, the uh, populistic kind of government is the best. It fits very well because there is a kind of 
uh, attempt to unify the people in and claiming that they are the right one and they want to see it and they can see it uh, under the eyes who are the good ones. Remember that populism all the time claims that not the people, but the right people. Not merely we the people, but we are the good people. You know, the good workers, those who are those who pay taxes, those who do sacrifice, those who are ordinary people. We are the people, the good ones. So we have we ourselves put ourselves in the condition of the forum and we want to see how the leader operates. And we chastise them, we criticize them, and not because of ideas communist, socialist, liberalism, are completely irrelevant today, but because of how they present themselves to us. So we start analyzing through the, uh, through the audience and the, and the web, we start analyzing how they talk, what they do, how they behave, and we enter in these two kind of privatized way of judging. We judge the leaders, through the very kind of subjective morality, we judge our friends and our uh, people who know, we know. We judge them exactly as private selves, no longer as a political self. They lose their, in their personality, they lose their kind of political identification and become one of us. All the populist leaders used to say, I'm one of us. Fujimori used to say, I'm, I am your president. You chose me, I am yours. Meaning, I am one of you. Uh, we are the same. So we can use the same, the same uh, judgment, the same moral language to uh, express uh, our, uh, our judgment. This is, in my view at least, uh, what is the transformation today. So it's a transformation concerning the system of opinion. It's a transformation concerning the organization of, uh, of the audience and this centrality of the public versus the citizen. So it's not that we claim for more action in the 60s. The youth they used to claim direct democracy, assembly democracy. They were in the assembly from morning to the night, right? Today we don't see that around. We don't see the myth of assemblyism in our city. What we claim in effect is not participation, through direct actions in the public, but participation through the media, participation through the net, participation through the web. So it is thus a kind of public participation. We are public, we are not citizen in action. And thus, of the two actions we can produce, judgment and direct participation, we choose judgment. We are judgmental kind of public who, uh, which every day produce a list of judgment concerning uh, the leaders and those who uh, speak in our name. So, centrality of judgment over the will, centrality of opinion over institutions, to the point that today a populist leader practically is on the web every minute. It's no longer institutions his place. His place is Twitter, Facebook, and everything that can allow him a direct impact and direct connections with the public. So institutions are practically far away from us, even more than they were before when there were party system. This is a very paradoxical. We don't pay attention to them anymore. What we pay attention <laughs> is to those who occupy them in our names and as part of us, the leader, and we <coughs> interact with them every day every day. So, so much to the point that uh, in my country, for instance, uh, Salvini, who is a minister of interior, uh, he never dressed as a minister. He dressed with the uh, costume of the police, since he's the chief of the minister, of, of, of the police. He dressed as his people, as he says, I am the people, and thus I dress like my people. I am not an establishment, I don't dress with the three-piece suit and the tie, because this would reveal that I am separated from you. I am you. So, in this way, guess what? It is very hard to understand what he's doing and what he's actually producing as a minister, because we don't, we don't know 
We don't know anymore what the institutional side of the story is. What we instead know is the ma many words that every day are in today's web, they come to us with images, uh, you know, guessing what kind of language. Totally private language. Privatization of language. Private language. So he, woke, he walks up in the morning and tells you, good morning, my guys, what are you doing today? I'm having, you know, Nutella and bread. And you? <laughs> and so in the, at, at noon, it tells you, what are you going to have for dinner, for lunch? I'm having this and that. And you? So there is this kind of conversational privatizations in everyday life. So that the leader is one of us because we don't see anymore the institutional moment. But this is very tricky, right? Because the institutional is there, producing the regulations, producing decisions, producing laws, and yet we don't pay attention to that. We pay attention to these images, public, audience, that we like and we are enamored so much, like in a movie. So the risk of all of that is a paradox. This leaders that claim to be close to the people and as uh, the great uh, um, Canovan used to say, what is populism? They claim that we bring people to politics and we bring politics to the people. So with this unification, we did the inside and the outside, the institution and the people. Good. So the paradox is that institutions were closest to us were when there were parties operating. That is this intermediation of establishment. Today, that they seem to be one thing with us, we don't see them anymore, how, how they operate, because we are not put in the position of seeing them, but only to see those who play the game. So I think that these are the risks we have. Now, I want to close, uh, because I'm talking to my parents, and we have a conversation, it's much better. So, can we can you use the word crisis? I have, I have a lot of troubles with this word. First of all, because as a Greek word, it means judgment. Every time we make a judgment, we enter into a crisis. Crisis means a separate split between a moment and another one. Every time we have to make a decision, what do I do? I do A or B. That is the moment of judgmental decision and crisis. So crisis has to do with democracy then, with a way of making decision public through judgment and the will. So is uh, democracy is the government of crisis that is capable of governing crisis, transforming crisis into a way for new decisions and new laws. So why do we call it crisis? I think it's not a good uh, argument. It doesn't give us the sense unless by crisis we mean a a crisis of values, unless we mean that there is a crisis of something deeper than simply institutional or procedural, a crisis of language, a crisis of value, a crisis of identification, well, but in this case, it would be better to express better and in detail all these elements that we think they are into a change or a, in a crisis. Is the ethos of the state that this change? Is the ethos of institution that is into a crisis? Is the sense of separation of public and private that is into a crisis? Is the privatization of media? Uh, that is a real issue. All our medias are a kind of privatized entities. And according to John Dunn, actually in the entire universe, you don't find any more or very rarely public own uh, medias. Many of the time, most of the time, they are privatized. So privatization and media, these are real issues that we should uh, analyze. So in order to speak about what? In order to speak about transformation. Why I say transformation instead of crisis? Because there is the sense that things are moving changing procedures, changing institutions, and, in, and we need to know them very well in order to provide for that institutional imaginary that is capable, perhaps, to allow us to fix things, to introduce new procedures, or to introduce new institutions. We need to make a kind of changes inside of our system of democracy in order to deal with this new reality. It's a new reality that we are facing. Um, and perhaps, and 
this is my optimistic moment. Uh, since democracy, among the many regime, the, the regimes, is the only one that is capable of generating problems and solving them in its own way, without uh, never solving forever, because it's a permanent uh, uh, construction of change and laws, fine. But with the ability of, as John Dewey used to say, with the ability of uh, creating new strategies for solving these problems. So here we are. If we see that the public is changing that way, that the audience makes such an impact in decision making, that the citizens have changed their own functions from actions to judgment, then perhaps a democracy that wants to survive and not to become simply a la Aristotle, the last stage before something that we don't even like to pronounce, then few new kind of institutional designs or new kind of procedures are in need. Uh, we are in need of, and there is actually around the world, uh, people or scholars who are precisely working on these aspects. What, how to intervene in the domain of the new internet, what to do in the domain of fake news, and so on and so forth. So, there are new kind of problems that requires democracy to be alert and to be capable of solutions that are capable of solving without uh, violating its own principles. So solving while reproducing itself, solving while protecting itself. So this is the important uh, um, you know, challenge that we have today. And I think I will stop here. <laughs> Thank you. I hope somebody asked a question now. Yeah. So Beatrice, thank you very much for I would say one of the best characteristics for provoking action. Yes, thank you. For provoking action. Um, uh, we have some time for questions. Um, but I will use my previous position. Yes, now. use the previous position. <laughs> and uh, I will I will kindly ask you uh, whether you could elaborate a little bit on the, on the topic you mentioned earlier uh, because you said uh, there are people who work on a new yeah. institution or new uh, a new program have to face the challenges that yes. uh, this uh, direct representative democracy and, and the internet and web brings so, so could you please elaborate a little bit on the topic more and could you say how we should face if at all if at all we should face a fake news mm -hmm. Which is a huge problem in this country. Well, let's talk about that because it's the most uh, dramatic one somehow. Because uh, we talk about that every day and more than once every day. Um, it is very hard to intervene uh, in the public opinion or in the domain of free speech, uh, freedom of thought, and uh, diffusion of ideas. Um, Alexis de Tocqueville in Democracy in America has a chapter on. Uh, Freedom of the press, which is it is a crucial chapter, very important. And it is a little bit skeptical and dramatic, dramatic with the commas, of course. Nothing is dramatic in democracy, but a little <laughs> saying that uh, um, we don't like the press in, 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 in infiltrating in our life, uh, trying to put our private into the public. This is disgusting, he used to say. This is terrible. And yet we have it. We need it. Because we need to know how the public officers operate, how the judge operates, whether there are uh, reasons for thinking about corruptions, whether there are uh, bad use of the law. So we need to know in order to judge, to kick off power, to protect ourselves from privileges and violation and arbitrariness. So, freedom of the press is kind of republican freedom because it gives us the ability of controlling those who are in power and also to stimulate and to give input to them to make them understand what we would like to have instead. So we cannot get rid of, even if it is very, sometimes, 
undigestible. Because, you know, you know, the paparazzi, they used to come everywhere to ask, this is undigestible. How can we do with this undigestibility? Can we use the law? That is, can we use the system of coercion in order to put limits? He said, no way. Because once you have done so, you never know where you will end. Because once you have a judge or an authority that is there to judge what is the good news and the right news and the bad news, it means that this judge has an absolute power. It is already a tyrant. Because he's the one who gives us the last word on what we can think or not, or what we can read or not. So there is no way to intervene in controlling. Unless, of course, you use the press in order to destroy the respectability of a person, the honorability, you destroy. There are, the law is always attentive to this aspect. It's never the case that we have simply freedom of the press without limitations. It's not the case. There are limitations <coughs> by law, but these limitations are very well connected to the uh, um, private, the, the basic rights, uh, the basic human rights of privacy and uh, the, the, the protection of the person. Huh? But you cannot intervene in terms of uh, having a kind of, uh, you know, archive that tells you which is the right news and the bad news. It's impossible. So what to do? In a recent uh, um, paper, not yet published, but is in the process of discussion with, uh, with us and with our other colleagues, uh, Joshua Ober and um, Arkham Fang, they wrote this article together. Remember, Joshua Ober works for Apple and uh, operates inside of the uh, kind of uh, democracy within uh, the corporate Apple. Um, Apple, uh, sorry. And, uh, and it tells us that, okay, fine, it's possible that you have the production of fake news. But there is no way of uh, intervening with the coercive, coercive system the only way is to put inside or to create, and this is he's talking about these people in Palo Alto or wherever he is there, in order to give them the chance through technology to introduce element of control or to introduce element of denunciations, right? That puts limits to the use of the net or, and this is incredible because it goes back to the private, or he hopes, and this is a process of education, that uh, Individuals, we the people, uh, we individual citizens, we, uh, by learning out of mistakes uh, and by going through this uh, mm, something that we don't like about uh, the fake news, we, in the future generation perhaps he says, that is, we have to learn how to use it, we enter into a new ethos, a new ethical domain, the domain of self-curing self-curing, self-taking care of uh, how, to use the, how to use the web is not very much, as you can say. I mean, believe it's, it's a kind of hoping in the technology and in the moral evolution of the new species. I mean, people, the, the, there is no many other chances to do. Well, I cannot say, perhaps this is, this, this is, a, is, a, is a way of, is an, unsol an unsolvable uh, problem. But if it is an unsolvable problem, one day, I mean, I was uh, uh, very uh, uh, con 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 uh, um, surprised by a word used by uh, uh, Beppe Grillo, you know, the movement, the, the one who founded in Italy the uh, Five Stars movement. He says, what is a fake news? How long a fake news lasts? A fake news, as soon as you say this is a fake news, it's no longer fake. Otherwise, you don't recognize it as a fake. So when you say this is a fake news, already you have the sense that you discover the truth or some truthfulness that allows you to say that this is fake. So the pronunciation of fake news is already a recognition that there is a cognitive advancement in the understanding of what is fake. Otherwise, we don't recognize it as such. So, thus, conclusion of him, the way is, the way to do it is by exposing, throw it on the public so that 
we pay attention to some people in one fake news, some other people, other fake news, and we discover it. We become, all of us, Sherlock Holmes kind of, right? <laughs> Looking for fake news. So, uh, that, uh, they are very, you know, um, um, I don't know how much they are satisfiable as a question, but I don't have, uh, I don't think that through intervention by the state, you can solve the problem. This is a self-governing problem. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay. Um, okay, so now we have some time for questions from the audience. Okay, uh, so I have some two questions. So, Valeria Correa is first. Can I see you? Yeah. yeah. Um, Professor Rupinati, thank you so much. That was really insightful and thought provoking. And Valeria Karablova from Charles University. Ah. Um, you started with a distinction between institutional and non institutional yes. domains of democracy. And you said with that with the first one, it's kind of okay. And then you proceeded with sort of describing what's happening in this non institutional. And what I want to ask you is precisely how this whole framework of the audience democracy influences the institutional politics. Because if we have this shift from meritocracy yeah. to ability to impress, from competence to performative, performative whatever, uh, so is it happening in institutional politics as well, when a politician meets another politician, so not only the audience, right, but, but among themselves, is it still about competence or is it also performative? Because when I see Guy Verhofstadt, for example, it, it seems more like performance, right? So what do they do? Are they just trying to, uh, to show how many likes they collect and who has the bigger audience and whatever, or they still try to perform? So how does it work there? Yeah. Thank you. It's when I said at the, at the end of, thank you, at the end, should I answer now? Uh, at the end of the, of the presentation, in effect, the paradox is that in this distinction, we see only one aspect. We see the aspect of public, of publicity, of the audience. And this transparency makes us opaque, makes opaque the other world, the, the institutional world. We see everything about the leader, because the leader wants us to see what he wants us to see, of course. And this total vision, or total transparency, so-called, makes instead the, uh, the other part of the, of the story of democracy, the institutional one, very opaque. Very opaque because generally, no, we don't know, uh, for instance, we speak about the audience, right? But the audience is not something that comes by itself. It is made also of experts, uh, experts of communications, experts of uh, public media uh, communication. So if you see how today the leaders are operating, they don't even have a party of expert people around them. They have experts of communications and media because they want to test every moment whether they have to do A instead of B, whether they have to say that instead of that. So, there is a kind of ruling of uh, ruling power of the uh, uh, audience, which escapes completely to accountability to us, although they operate truly inside of the of the palazzo, so called, of the institutions. Now, this is uh, what uh, we have to uh, yes, to, have to pay attention a lot when we speak about the uh, they don't, populists don't change, but they don't change necessarily institutions, but the way in which they operate in this way changes the practice in which institutions are operated. And the practice is also a way of making or remaking institutions. In, a, in an old book by, um, by Tully uh, on uh, the presidential um, rhetoric uh, about uh, practically how Winston, Wilson, Woodrow Wilson started this new plebiscitary president in the States. What he noticed, the first thing he noticed is that for the first time, the president, instead of talking to the people passing through the Congress, as they used to do, they didn't talk directly to the people before, he instead jumped the Congress and talked directly to the people. So we have two languages, he said. The language through institutions, 
talking to the people through the formalistic language, language of the institutions, or directly to the people. So that was the beginning. Now, today we are only practically talking directly to the people. The other one, we don't have it anymore. I mean, the parliaments are less and less relevant today than they were those days. So it means that these expansions of the moment of public or opinion has an impact over the way institutions operate. Although, formally speaking, they don't change, but they change in the practice. Thank you very much, Madam Professor, for the interesting lecture. I was listening to concentrated and it was very interesting for me um, but uh, I'm uh, uh, I'm rather interested in the situation in Czech Republic you you yeah. mentioned Hungary and <laughs> Poland that they are you don't like the word crisis but you, you speak more. about yeah. Yeah. and uh, I would like to tell you that our constitution is white and it's not uh, concrete it's it has only directions and you can still be in the constitution borders and so I would like to ask you when... Can, I, can I give you, can I ask you to give an example? Oh, now we have a president which is uh, uh, elected directly from the people and he is uh, not for European Union, he is for Putin in Russia. Then we have Prime Minister Babish which is uh, is a oligarch which owns media. I think that was good. <laughs> yes, and also he is criminally investigated now. So I would like to ask you when, for me as an uh, active citizen, when the red light has to start to blink, uh, because the constitution actually is not changed, but. Uh, but I am a little bit afraid that the democracy is not in crisis, as you, as you don't like, <laughs> but it's moving somewhere. But what for me should be the red, red lines, the red uh, blinking light, which for me is showing that something is wrong in Czech Republic with the democracy. Thank you. Huh. So when we can say that uh, a democracy is uh, just very close to be something else. Where is the, the red line, right? Well, think about uh, today, and I, I, I have to say I don't know very much about uh, But in the very moment you are worried about and you can express your worriness and connect with others and make an argument publicly, well, you are still here. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to be so dismissive, it's very important. But, think about uh, Hungary. Recently, they had demonstrations on the square. Many demonstrations, right? It, it's at least, I, I, on the newspapers, this is what I saw. Because of a legislation called slave labor, kind of a legislation concerning, uh, you know, then, uh, in order to to solve the problem of shortage of work, they had to put uh, some extra hour, and they paid the extra hour even three years after, and so on so forth, so they can't lose late. And you had demonstration on the square. That, that is a good sign. Democracy is not simply inside of the institutions, but it's what citizens do and can do. And it's, it's a powerful system. It uh, seems, seems to be very fragile, uh, you know, but it's not at all, because you have this. People have the power to react and to, uh, to judge and to organize. Until you have this power, you are inside. And until you can say, well, when I see the, green, the, the, the red light, then, well, you already, you already express your democratic view in this way, right? I know that is not very much, but I am a proceduralist. I do believe that until you can have, without risking your life, because li liberty, guys, is not simply to do what uh, you like, but is to do what you like in tranquility. That is, you don't have to be scared that other people spy, that other people denounce you, that you can go to jail. If you have rights and you have that kind of situation, those rights are public 
kind of rights. So, liberty implies that you can, you know, that you have tranquility of your action. When you can do so, well, you don't like the government? Mobilize. Pe petition, mobilizations, writing, organizing, voting, disobedience, civil disobedience. So there are many p potentialities. Uh, thank you also for your lecture. Thank you. Uh, your lecture wasn't so much optimistic as it was at the beginning. <laughs> but uh, my question uh, would be, uh, don't you think that there are some, uh, let's say, social or historical cultural presupposition for that uh, populist transformation of the yeah. democracy? You are yeah. talking about Trump, Orban, Kaczynski in Poland. These societies are very different, yeah. with yeah. different historical traditions and so on. Yeah. Orban can say that he continues uh, what the Hungarian tradition in politics uh, should be or so on. Uh, you are talking about this transformation in the same vocabulary, but I think there must be some differences. This is a very, very great question and rightly critical question because, you know, you talk, you cannot uh, indulge too much in uh, specificity. You have to have this kind of generality. Um, you know, populism is a strange beast because it is very hard to define, it is impossible to define because it is based and is so connected to the very culture, political culture and historical and social organization of a specific society in which it develops. So we can also only try to have and to um, isolate some general trends that is common to all kinds, but each of them is unique in this kind. So, I think, I'm not an economist, I'm not a sociologist, I don't do this kind of job, but in my view, uh, I don't invent this, is, I simply read what uh, experts or, or academic, uh, other faculties they write, <coughs> they write. The condition in which uh, we are talking about today, that is populism, is connected to a change or transformation in society that we don't pay attention to enough. So, one, think about how and when a representative democracy after World War II or here with the Hubble came alive. It came alive with the prospectus of expansion, the prospectus of diffusion of power, distribution of power, diffusion of power, and also well-being of the large majority of the people. Democracy is the place in which the people have the say, and the people is ordinary people, people who need to work, people who need, uh, who need uh, hospitals and schools, and thus they want the government to have this kind of engagement in their social life. Uh, if you read the T.H. Marshall in the 50s when he writes about social classes and democracy, this is about, right. Now what we are witnessing today it is instead a situation in which uh, not only we are asked from Brussels, from our government, to make sacrifices to uh, austerity program, to cut down, to cut down, to privatize and so on and so forth. It is a new change. It's a change in abandoning uh, social welfare states for a neo, for liberal kind of organization of society. This comes with some cost, and the cost has to do with uh, impoverishment of the middle class. So there are very important studies about, not only Piketty, of course, uh, Atkinson, about uh, the growth of inequality, which would be better instead of speaking about inequality, of speaking about the narrowing of the middle class, because the middle is the subject, uh, uh, the, 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 the backbone of, the, of democracy. It means that uh, many more people, they don't have certainty for tomorrow. They don't have the ability of planning their life for a span of time that is long enough to create something. So, 
privatiz precarization of job, a kind of everyday shortage time kind of perspective. This changes the way in which people think. Habermas wrote recently, and not only him, I mean, uh, Strake uh, or Klaus Hoff uh, wrote extensively about that, saying that precisely because of this situation of every day taking care of our life, uh, many, many young people, they have one year grant, grant, and what about the next year? And so this kind of short-termism makes our mm, self a citizen uh, more attentive to the present time, presentism, uh, present, because we have to solve present issues. We cannot have any more long-term uh, projections of creating a society as it was in the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, and so on and so forth. This means that the social aspect, the economic aspect, are essential, and I think that uh, even the hyper-privatizations or in, of, of many uh, agencies, social agency, is a problem for a democracy because democracy needs to have a large public and needs to have citizens with a sense of uh, stability in life. Uh, you know, uh, otherwise it's very easy to be trapped into the uh, emergency power, emergency uh, arguments. So. I, I, I agree with you, the more, uh, each country has some specificities that we cannot uh, ignore. But, although we have to know the specificity, they have something in common. Populism, as uh, Federico Finkelstein writes, today is a kind of global phenomenon. Wherever you go, you have a kind of uh, leaders who use the same methods of propaganda, use the same language, you have, they have the same... Uh, Arguments and they tend to be capable of telling people that they are representing them while they are making, in fact, a kind of policies that are not necessarily in the interest of the people. So, uh, I would say that we have to consider both both the aspect of contextual specificity and the aspect of generality, otherwise, we are, we are trapped inside of each history and each country. Uh, so this is what my question, my answer. Okay. Uh, we, have, we have almost run of our time, so we have a time for one uh, brief question and brief answer. <laughs> answer no, very brief. Brief answer. Brief, brief answer. Oh, sorry. I talk too much, I know. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Marian Sakira. Um, I promise my, my, my question will be uh, short. Or my, my two uh, questions will be short. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in, in the beginning of your of your lecture, you mentioned that the current change within democracy is a language change, not an institutional one. But quite later, you said that uh, we can we can see some some or many examples of an institutional change. For example. Uh, the Hungarian Constitution, yeah. or uh, as it was said by one of the one of the uh, 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 one of those uh, f f from from the from the audience, uh, uh, an example of the Czech uh, Czech politics, uh, where the constitutional text is uh, variously interpreted by the politicians, uh, or even by the by the president. Uh, so, can we say that uh, this uh, language change? Uh, could be interpreted or uh, or transformed into into the institutional one. This is my first short question, and the second short. This, this is a great question. Uh, 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 could be could, could, uh, can we can we find some discursive instruments which could help us to overcome this uh, language or and or institutional change of uh, democracy, uh, especially when we see. Uh, those who try to to contest the the very uh, foundings or uh, or uh, values of our uh, liberal democracy. You mentioned, for example, civil dis disobedience and and the instruments uh, interconnected with this. But uh, my question goes to to discursive instruments. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. The first one. It's a, a great one because it makes uh, populism today a kind of constitute. 
There is a constitutional populism, post or, or populist constitutionalism, as you uh, do what you uh, use the word as you as you prefer. Meaning that uh, there is this attempt of making a kind of uh, um, seeking legitimacy through the constitution. It's not enough to have a majority. It's not enough, and when they can, or they have the possibility and the chance, many populists, they tend to go to the constitution, they become constituent power, they want to have their own constituent power in order to make their own legitimacy. This is very interesting for me, because all the tyrannical system, they didn't do that, they simply shut down the constitution, they closed borders, they took away passports from people, they sent people to jail. Here, they stay, instead, they want to be constitutionalized. So, it's a form of the is a form of democracy that is not anymore similar to the one based on division of power and so on and so forth, and yet wants to have the constitutions in his own way. So I find this uh, intriguing, but it's a fact. They are not simply enough with the simple majority. They want simple majority, constitutionalized. As I said before, they want to elite what they do practically is to take away the separation of two narrow uh, the distance between constitutional legal order and ordinary legislation. The ordinary becomes constitutionalized. The other question you are for, you said, for discourse, um, strategy instead of contestations, even sometimes violence, or, or disagreements, or uh, uh, disobedience. Well, I, I do agree with you, and I would, well, I would tend to be sympathetic with the, your position, because, and, because democracy is the regime of discourse. It is the only system of power and economic, or, I'm sorry, and the social and, the, and the political power and legal power in which discourse is crucial. We say yes and no. Sometimes we motivate, not always, and I don't think that we have any kind of obligation or justification, we ordinary citizens, but certain institutions people have, Rawls would say that uh, we have the duty of civility, and this is good, in order to have a kind of uh, friendship, hmm? kind of uh, connections with other citizens, to have uh, idem sentire de republica, as they used to say in the past, and this a common, a common sense together, fine. This goes together with the, the disposition of the people and the politicians to do so. But what if, what if this discourse uh, strategy or discourse ethos becomes thrust down, doesn't work, or the new institute or the new media, think about internet, makes it less relevant or less preponderant? Perhaps you are forced into the using of other instruments. Also, not only, also. The same uh, um, John uh, uh, Rawls uh, had an article in 68 that published in, inside of his classical theory of justice about disobedience. So, there are moments uh, in which perhaps situations, like, uh, dramatic situations, in which perhaps um, this was the case with Martin Luther King, with, with, with the case of uh, the um, anti-racial mobilization in America. So, I don't want to make out of, a rule out of it, but uh, the, the deliberative aspect is crucial. I think that in some moments, mobilizing more emotions could be more inter important. For instance, think about partisanship. Uh, we are not simply like in a seminar room where we speak with other citizens that we respect. We have ideas concerning what kind of laws, how this president behaves we don't like. So we are not simply, you know, based on data, fact, but we have po emotion. We have uh, we express opinion, strongly uh, opinionated positions. So this needs to be expressed, and sometimes the deliberative aspect that we are talking about is 
less attentive about that or wants to smooth this kind of uh, heat of passions in order to put reason or reasonability uh, in actions more closely. I think we need perhaps both of them. I, I, I'm very um, fond of a book or a tradition now emerging inside of the rules and perhaps concerning uh, analysis or normative analysis and justification of parties and partisanship, I think is important. Uh, well, this is my long answer. <laughs> okay, so thank you. Uh, so uh, now it's time, but I, first of all, I have to thank you again for your thank you. No, you very interesting you. lecture and uh, yeah. for your kind answer. I also thank the audience for coming. Yeah, and great audience. Yeah. <laughs> I should come to Prague more frequently. Okay, join us in one. Okay, thanks.